Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Before we begin, let's have a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple widgets for you to use. All are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your screen space. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try and answer these during the session, but if we run out of time, they will be answered later via email. Please know we do capture all questions. We will be using interactive polling during today's session and encourage you to participate in the voting. Additional materials are available in the resource list. Please download those that you might find useful, and you can find out more about our speakers via the speaker bio widget. For the best viewing experience, we recommend closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background. This might, might help conserve your bandwidth. The webcast is being streamed to your computer. So for the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset volume is turned up. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. And if your slides are behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. We value your feedback, so please do complete the pop-up survey at the end of the webcast. An on-demand version of this webcast and slides will be shared with you tomorrow, and it can also be accessed via the same audience link that was sent to you today. We are honored to introduce our speakers. Eric Britton from Fathom Consulting, Shamik Dar from BNY Mellon Investment Management, Paul Bacon from Refinitiv, and Ross Finley from Thomson Reuters. Over to you, Ross. Great. Well, thank you very much for attending. Um, I'm going to be uh, serving as a moderator here, so you won't be hearing a lot from me. You'll be hearing a lot more from Eric and Shamik and Paul. Um, uh, seeing as I run polling at uh, Reuters, we thought it would be a good idea to start this off with a poll. Um, and it's a question that um, just about everybody, I think, who's probably dialed into this has thought about. So take a few seconds to think this through. What shape do you expect the recovery from this recession to take? It's a U, a V, an L, a W, or a tick mark. So I'll give you a few more seconds to come up with your answers. Five. Ross, I'm four, not seeing that question on the I'm not seeing the question on my live view. I don't know if other people are. Okay. Well give it another try. Can you see it now? Nope. It says live. Good. <laughs> Chairman, Everybody can on you the see panel it? can see it? I can see it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Maybe it's just mine. Okay, well. No problem. That's giving people a bit more time to think it through. So it's either a U, a V, an L, a W, or a tick mark. So I'll give you five more seconds to think. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, somewhat similar to the results that we had when we did this um, with an audience in Asia last week, almost exactly the same. Um, so the V-shaped recovery that uh, many people are hoping for seems to be uh, not in the, uh, the viewpoint here. Um, look, we put this to um, uh, economists just recently. Um, about 160, I think, responded to this, and it's almost exactly the same as the audience, which is a bit surprising. Um, so, look, let's uh, let's um, ask um, Eric. Uh, what do you think? I don't think you're in the U camp. No. So, I think the U is it, for us anyway. At Fathom is the least likely outcome. I think the the a V shaped. Uh, recovery, which is uh, what the Bank of England, by the way, uh, just this morning put out a scenario, not a forecast, a mm -hmm. scenario indicating something that looks a lot like a V, where they're back to the pre-crisis trajectory uh, by the middle or end of next year, implying very strong growth in the second half of 
of this year and, and mm. into the first half of next year too. Um, that's quite close to our V-shaped scenario as well. And that scenario still is a realistic possibility in our view, um, as is an L-shaped scenario. The one that's not so mm. realistic for us is a U, because if we get into a prolonged period of downturn of slow growth or no growth, then it's hard to see how we avoid um, that morphing into an L. It becomes uh, the firm's mm go out of business, people get laid off, their skills atrophy, they become demotivated, the bad debts in the banking sector build up, all of that pushes us towards an L. I don't see the U as a, as a stable outcome in this environment. It's either going to be a V or it's going to be an L mm. for us. And just to step back for one second, it's worth just reflecting on the severity of this, the downturn that's in prospect that's happening right now, maybe... Mm. The worst has already happened in levels terms. Maybe we're at that point. But the severity of it, we've never seen in recorded economic history back to the 1300s. Uh, we've never mm. seen anything this severe happen this quickly, not even close to this severe this quickly, including in wars, including in the post-war period of the Spanish flu and all the rest of it. Nothing this bad ever and it's worth just bearing that in mind when we're talking about the rest of the scenarios. That said, in the UK, for example, what's happening is with is the average standard of living in the UK has fallen, uh, taking us mm. back to uh, levels of standards of living that we, we'd last enjoyed and experienced in about 2001. Um, I'm old enough to fondly remember 2001, and absent the events of September the 11th of that year, yeah. Um, that, that year was fine. It felt fine. The standard of living was fine. So it's a big hit to our standard of living now, but it's back to a standard of living that was kind of okay back in 2001. So we should have both of those perspectives in mind when we're thinking about the shape of the recovery. Shamik, um, what, what do you think? Are you pretty much aligned with Eric on that one? Um, to an extent, but I, I think there are slight differences. Um, I think the first thing to say is the situation is hugely uncertain. Which which of these shape, which of this alphabet soup we, we end up following uh, depends, mm. frankly, entirely on the course of the disease from here, and that is entirely that's still very very uncertain. If we get a some kind of vaccine or a treatment, then a V becomes more likely. If you know lockdown ends up, if, if we ease lockdown and uh, there's a second wave, then you get a U or a W, it seems to me. If there's permanent disruption to the supply side of the economy, like as Eric described, then, then an L becomes more likely. So <clears throat> I think first and foremost, it's hugely uncertain and, um, uh, you know, it depends on the course of the disease. The second thing I'd say is that I'm probably a bit more V-like than, than most, a bit more um, V-like maybe than... And I, Eric just outlined that it's perfect, a real life, realistic possibility. One mm -hmm. thing I would say, though, is it's really important at the moment to, to start to, um, you know, define more closely what we mean by these by these letters, because I think there's likely to be a fair amount of confusion in the, in the, in the quarter or two ahead. Take, so for instance, mm -hmm. even before the back about their forecast this morning, I was, put, I was putting forward the following example. Say, Say the UK economy does shrink by 30% uh, in the second quarter, which is pretty likely. We've been saying that for a while. The bank says that now. If it shrinks by 30% in the second quarter and we only open up a third of the shutdown economy in the third quarter, mm. then the GDP growth rate in the third quarter will be something like 14%, 14% quarter on quarter. Now, some people who aren't looking you know, into, in huge debt, this will say, wow, 14%, that's a really strong growth rate, that's a V. Uh, mm. And it might be a V, but is it a V if two-thirds of the shutdown economy is still shut down? You know, you might argue that's a U. I think the only way to think about this um, properly is to think about, just as Eric said, when we get back, if you like, to pre-crisis level. Um, I think mm. it's a V if we get to the pre-crisis level by the end of 2021, which is roughly the third of that. If it takes longer than that, um, 2022, 2023, then you're sort of at least a U, possibly a W. So if you really wanted to pin me down, I would say I'm 
more in the V camp because I think we can get back to the pre-crisis level of GDP by the end of 2021. Uh, but that still means a fairly attenuated um, uh, recovery. I guess as ever, the difference is, is between what the average person feels and how an economist describes a V. Um, exactly. It'd probably be fair to say there's a lot of people out there who are exposed to these letters in this discussion who think a, a, a V means that they'll get the job back rather quickly. And so that sort of brings us to the, the policy response. Um, unprecedented, um, the, you know, the, the, the amount of polling we've done on this has just been incredible and the, the, the sums are eye-watering. If we get into a situation where the bounce back is not what, what you would like and isn't, isn't matching your forecast with the Bank of England, how much policy response is there left after this? Has enough been done? And I think maybe before I get um, you to uh, answer that question, I think it would be good to get the audience views. Um, so if everybody could uh, figure out whether the global response has been enough. And I think, you know, this is obviously subjective to, you know, w which country you're looking at, but collectively, does the audience think that the global economic response so far, I'm not sure why the slide has bounced back, but I'm gonna move it back to the question that I was asking. Um, so the question is, how do you rate the global economic policy response from central banks and government so far? Has it been not enough? Has it been about right? Has it been too much? And Eric and Chamek, I assume you can see this slide. We had a problem with it bouncing around. Can we see this? Yeah? See it, yeah. Um, I can't, I'm okay. afraid, so you'll have to tell me the answer to that, but, uh, but I'm sure okay. hopefully others. So I'll read it through um, again to the audience. Um, how do you rate the global economic policy response from central banks and governments so far? Not enough, about right, or too much? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. About right. I don't know if you can see that, Eric, but we've got 53.6% of the audience has said about right. Uh, just, just under 29 saying not enough and uh, just under 18 saying too much. Surprising? The too much ones, I'm surprised by. I must say, I think, mm. uh, I think uh, we're in a in a world. I saw a neat chart on Twitter the other day. Someone saying that use of the word unprecedented is unprecedented <laughs> um, at the moment. You can you, you can track it, uh, Google Trends, etc. And the use of unprecedented has absolutely spiked in all things. But it's it's accurate because we are in genuinely unprecedented times. A way of thinking about that is. A, a crisis this severe, um, you can almost think the role of government and the central banks in terms of economic policy, if they did nothing whatsoever for the rest of the time, but just intervene in cases like this, then that's 80% of their job done. The rest of it fiddling around with, are we going to get inflation at 2.3 or 2.2? I mean, who cares in the scheme of things compared to this? If they just wash their hands of all of that trivia, and just focused on this, then that would be most of their job done. In these circumstances, there's really no limit, in my view, to what the government can do uh, between itself and the Bank of England so, and, and the other central banks around the world. The Bank of England has more or less announced that it's going to um, uh, monetize uh, the deficit in the UK, which means to say just print money and buy government de debt directly off the government. There's no limit to how much of that they can do in principle. And there should be no limit in practice. If they feel they need to do more, do more. Chuck absolutely everything you've got at it. That's exactly the role of government. Thus far, they have, the magnitudes are, as you say, Ross, eye-watering, and so they should be. There are concerns, though, about some of the bottlenecks. The, the, are, is the money getting to the right people? Is it getting to them quickly enough? Uh, it's small firms, for example having to wrangle for three or four weeks before they get or don't get the loan guaranteed by the government that, that, 
that Rishi Sunak was talking about. But many of those firms, three or four weeks is going to be too long. They'll be out of business already before they, they access that, that money. Um, and that's problematic. Similarly, with people laid off, if they are laid off, or access to furlough funds, etc. Um, do they get the money quickly enough to prevent these uh, really big dislocations that can morph into an hour? Are they doing enough? In magnitude, yes. In uh, uh, getting around these bottlenecks, my current judgment is no, and I'm disappointed about that, and I'm concerned that that's going to lead us away from a V and towards an L. Well, uh, Shamik, uh, maybe we'll get your uh, view on that too. Are you uh, roughly the same view as Eric? More needs yeah. to be done? Uh, well, what I would say is, look, this is a really good start. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with Eric about that. Just put some numbers on it. If the world economy shrinks by about 10% in the second quarter, which is roughly uh, our estimate, then that's around eight, eight to eight half trillion dollars of world GDP. Um, and if you think about it, the amount of QE that the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, and the Bank of Japan have put in, just those four central banks amounts to six and a half, roughly a trillion dollars. And then if you add on top of that the, the at least as much, possibly larger fiscal stimulus globally, then then I think you know in terms of the the gaps, you know, yes, they've done they've they've done broadly speaking uh, as much as they should have at the moment. That doesn't mean they shouldn't do more. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's really important that we monitor things and be prepared to do more. Um, so, uh, and I think everyone is on that on that page. But broadly speaking, I think we're roughly in the right place at, at the moment. I think we've also, within fiscal policy, we've done the right thing by focusing on social insurance measures as opposed to mm -hmm. traditional stimulus. When you're when you're stuck at home and you can't spend on stuff and you're furloughed from from um, from work, then it's not always possible for the traditional Keynesian multiplier to work because ultimately mm. you can't generate income for those people who are furloughed uh, from industries that aren't being spent on. So so uh, it makes much more sense to to focus on social insurance to, to replace the incomes that have been have been lost, if you like, and I think that's a good thing. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the final thing I'd say is that I, I like Eric, am surprised at the too much, uh, mm. too much percent. I think there are a lot of stories out there circulating about how this will end up in some kind of government debt crisis and or some kind of hyperinflation. I think that's largely hogwash. Um, I think the, the mm. deficits that we're seeing are the natural counterpart of, you know, huge amounts of extra saving by the private sector. You know, no one's spending, no one's mm. investing. So, you know, all the government's doing is rechanneling the, the financial surplus of the private sector into and sustaining demand that way. I think that, in that sense, we're borrowing from ourselves. We're not borrowing from the future from from abroad generally. So, um, I think yeah. I think that sort of sense. And like Eric, I'm completely, pretty much sanguine about about monetary financing as well, especially at zero interest rates when there are, when there's a huge demand for cash out there and safe assets, and where at least for the moment central banks remain independent and, and will be prepared to take that back at some point in the future when we get get back to normal. Now it's a different question if governments start to take over central banks, but we, we can maybe mm. come to that later. I think that's going to happen, but. But so long as central banks remain independent, I think um, I'm perfectly sanguine about that. Well, one, one, you know, obviously there's a divide here between developed markets, markets and emerging markets, and we've been speaking about developed markets mainly. Obviously, monetizing the debt is uh, is a thing you you don't do if you're an emerging market tapping into the IMF. Um, you know, Brazil headlines today are showing rather alarming numbers in terms of cases. Um, building up in a country like that. What about the policy room? Is there enough? What will some of these countries have to resort to if it gets as bad as it has done in, in, in Europe and the United States? You know, think of a country like Argentina, you know, that's already out of room. So I, I think that's a really great question. I think there's a, a huge problem in emerging economies uh, coming 
uh, around the corner if it's not there already, which, as you say, yeah. in, in advanced economies like the UK, the US, etc., we have, I mean, almost indefinite fiscal room. The US certainly, as the world's reserve currency, can more or less do whatever it likes on fiscal policy. Um, where do we stand? We're at kind of 80 to 100 percent government debt to GDP ratios, 80 in the UK, 100 in the US in gross terms. Mm. Japan is at 240 and has no problem financing its deficit whatsoever. It's absolutely mm. fine. Um, there's no, I don't see any reason to think that would be any different for the UK or for the US mm. or indeed for Europe if it could get its act together and do things in a coordinated fashion across Europe. But for emerging economies, it's a very different proposition. They don't have a credible fiscal authority in the same way that we do in advanced economies. So what happens if mm. they can't do the same, perform the same trick that we can, uh, but they're still going to need the same sort of support that we're getting? Where do they get it from? The only place they can get it from is us. And uh, so I yeah. would support, um, uh, and we, we are arguing, uh, that debt relief, debt forgiveness, mm. extension of new um, loans or grants to the emerging world in scale via institutions like the IMF and the World Bank and whatnot is really a critical thing right now, because otherwise mm. we're probably looking down the barrel of an emerging markets crisis, uh, starting with sovereign defaults in places like Argentina and Venezuela, yeah. and there's nothing to be done about Venezuela, but other, other countries in that mix too. Um, that uh, shouldn't be defaulting, or only would only that would only be happening because of this crisis. And, um, uh, we should let them default, <laughs> and we should uh, not punish the economies to the normal degree yeah. that they would be punished in this. Africa. Yeah, I mean the risk is is that the risk is that it opens up an even greater divide between the developed uh, world and and emerging markets if uh, if if this spreads the way it has done yeah. um, through Europe. Yeah. yeah. Shamik, um, any thoughts on that in terms of that divide and, and how much policy room there, there is in emerging markets? I mean, obviously, there's interest, rate, interest rates left to cut, but on the fiscal side. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for asking that question, Ross, because you're absolutely right. I, I should have made that distinction previously. I do think the PNs are in – certainly ends are in a very different position from, from the DN-focused uh, analysis I gave mm. earlier. Um, and I think the only thing I'd say is it is quite important to, to distinguish within the ends as well. They're, they're not quite the homogeneous block that were back 10, 15 years ago. Um, mm. For instance, pockets of, of, uh, of Asia, I think, will do pretty well coming out of this. But, but it is the countries that you've spoken about already, your Argentinas, your Brazils, your South Africas, which don't necessarily have fiscal credibility or the track record or well, frankly, the fiscal space to indulge in the kind of spending, supportive spending that um, that, that, uh, that countries in the developed world have done. And, and you're absolutely right that we need to do something. My my favourite solution would be before this, before moving straight to default would be to, to explore the kinds of avenues that that the uh, that the IMF. This this is an opportunity for the IMF. It seems to me to step in and, and, and do, mm. do the kind of job. And yeah. um, Interesting, interesting policy uh, initiatives such as setting up the SDR denominated borrowing, borrowing, borrowing fund, which amounts to I think about 500 billion SDRs, uh, mm. to, in, likely to help support um, uh, PMs is, is, is a is a is a good idea. Can I just add one more point? Uh, I think uh, within the DMs, so long as you do have uh, you start with an in initially relatively low debt level, and relatively low, I mean, you know, up to 80% of GDP, and you have an independent monetary policy, then I think you're fine. Um, and in mm -hmm. fact, you can, as Eric said, you can have a much higher initial debt level GDP like Japan and have an independent monetary policy, and you're absolutely fine. The, the country I worry mm -hmm. about the most here is Italy, because it has mm -hmm. an initially high level of GDP, but it doesn't have an independent monetary policy. Ultimately, the only way we're going to get out of this is by inflating the debt, debt away to some degree. Uh, and that means keeping yeah. bond yields, yields on debt, below the nominal growth rate of the economy for quite some time. Japan has the leeway to do that. It's explicitly yeah. doing that by bond yields. Italy does. 
which, which is why the issue of corona bonds and debt digitalization is so important. It's very right. interesting and looking at the, sorry, Ross, the, looking at the um, no, go ahead. stimulus measures that have been implemented or talked about across countries and the magnitudes of those. The magnitudes are very large right across the developed world, including in Italy. But the breakdown in Italy is the vast proportion in Italy is loans uh, that are being extended, not uh, grants mm -hmm. and cash handouts, because they don't have the cash. Uh, they don't have it yeah. and they don't have a means to get it. Uh, except for the agreement of the ECB and the other fiscal authorities in Europe, which is why it's all yeah. about loans. On whom will those loans be secured? Um, the Italian government, maybe. The Italian government is kind of fundamentally bust, as Shamit was pointing out. And uh, uh, for this to work, there has to be an implied guarantee from other parties, other fiscal authorities, particularly Germany, in Europe. And at the moment, that guarantee is not there. Um, and so there's a, there's a, there's a live issue in Europe, I think, that, that we could be back in Euro crisis territory again, um, unless they get coordinate themselves and get their action yeah. together and do the thing that everybody knows they should do, which is debt mutualization. Um, and yeah. if, if this might be the trigger for that. If it's not, then we've got a problem again. Yeah, I suspect if, if we had posed the question about the policy response and framed it around Europe, we wouldn't have had that many too muches, would we? No. <laughs> um, so, um, so look, I mean, I, just just moving on, we we had another uh, question that we wanted to ask of the audience, just to keep the discussion going. Um, this is the part that's very very difficult to forecast. Obviously, it has a lot to do with um, whether the virus continues spreading rapidly, whether there's a second round. But um, we want to um, get a view from the call uh, audience whether you expect a second wave of global economic damage from COVID-19. Um, it's uh, obviously a yes or no question, and it's difficult to tamp down because in many ways the first wave is still going through these emerging market countries that we're talking about. But I think we can separate it from what's happening now from the first wave to a second wave, which is what's going to obviously threaten Eric's V recovery forecast. So yes or no on that one, I'll give you five more seconds. Okay, let's see what people have said. Wow, that's similar to the Asian audience we had last, uh, last week, isn't it? A very, yeah. very high number on yes. Feeling nervous, Eric. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, the example of the Spanish flu is salutary here. The Spanish flu had three principal waves. The second wave was by far the most damaging, substantially more damaging in humanitarian terms and in economic terms than the first wave was. And uh, the second wave, the incidents, it hit a few months after the first wave had passed, had washed through. A few months after the first wave washes through here will take us to the winter uh, which is very concerning because health services tend to be overstretched in the winter anyway, mm. and layer on top of this a bigger wave of COVID, and you can immediately mm. see the, the magnitude of the problems concerned. However, uh, we're not in 1919 anymore. Hopefully, we mm. can plan a little bit better. We can rebuild supply chains a little bit better than we did then. If mm. we can't hit the second wave globally or in any individual country, and we don't have, for example, enough PPE. Um, uh, we don't have enough ventilators. We don't have enough intensive care units. We don't have track and trace in place and able to be rolled out in scale. If we don't have those things by the time the second wave hits, then the governments that are in place now will go down in history as the most incompetent governments of all time. The idea that you can get to that outcome with that amount of lead time and not prepare for it. And I'm, I'm right. fairly confident that the governments are preparing for it right now. And that preparation means that hopefully, even though if the humanitarian costs are large, and they probably will be in the second wave, the economic costs can be mitigated and can be reduced because different economic strategies present themselves if you've got all of that capacity in place in the health on the health side. 
such as you don't have to go to full lockdown if you've got track and trace and all the rest of it. People can still work. The economy can still function. So I'm very hopeful at the moment anyway that the economic damage in the second wave will be substantially less than it was in the first wave, even if the humanitarian damage is as large or larger. Um, but that may be misplaced confidence on my part in that, the competence of our government. But what you're underscoring is, is getting the health crisis right yeah. is the key to yeah. blocking another round of economic damage. It's not a trade-off between the two. It's getting the health crisis sorted. Of course, right? yeah. And of course, when the, if we come to that question of trade-offs, which I think is a was a, is a uh, a really weird question to be asking. Speaking as yeah. a macroeconomist, yeah. there's no tr there's no competition. Huh? We're talking about human life vis-a-vis right. -vis a few exactly. percent. GDP, uh, there's no contest there whatsoever. And, uh, uh, exactly. Shamik, any thoughts on that? Um, second yeah, round I mean, of damage and, and the health response? Yeah. I understand the audience's concern. I think it's almost inevitable that once lockdowns ease, um, but we will get some rise in infection rates and sadly in death rates as well. So in that sense, I think it's, I can understand where they're coming from. I would base my optimism, relative optimism, upon three things. The first is that, but hopefully, as Eric says, governments aren't stupid, and we've got a lot of examples from around the world now about how to deal with this. And therefore, I'm hoping that some kind of, uh, you know, that we can manage things uh, through some kind of smart intervention, i.e. we may have to sort of, reopen and reshut things, but we can do so in a relatively targeted way by looking at those areas where infection rates are really picking up rapidly, by testing more widely, et cetera, et cetera. Um, secondly, I'm quite, I'm hopeful that treatments will become a bigger part of, of, of what we do going forward. Now, that's not the same as a vaccine or a cure, but it might be that we can manage the disease better and there are some, I think, um, relatively encouraging results from some anti-inflammatories in particular that, that suggest we can, we can manage and reduce mortality rates through treatments. And then thirdly, uh, as I say, I think, I don't know for certain, but I think most governments have invested pretty substantially in increasing their health capacity, capacity of the healthcare sector. So... That doesn't seem to be, I mean, it's, I, I don't want to guarantee anything, but, but the issue here is not whether, whether or not we get a second wave, but do we get a second wave that overwhelms the, the healthcare service? My sense is that most countries have been investing sufficiently and that there are signs of, quotes, relative to where we are now, at least, overcapacity, which, which is there to be filled. So those three things make me, make me more optimistic that it may not have the, the economic Hmm. Okay. Well, look, um, we've uh, we've not given a chance um, for Paul to jump into this discussion. And I realize, uh, Paul, you've been uh, waiting there for about half an hour while we're <laughs> riffing on about economics. But uh, look, uh, one of the things we wanted to ask you, um, and this is something that's been very much on my mind, obviously, as a, as a pollster. Uh, with mm -hmm. Reuters and 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 data consumption and the newswire and how focus has changed, what's happened to the trend in terms of the kind of data that people are looking for, data consumption, and what kind of requests now are you seeing coming since um, COVID nineteen has had such a massive impact on markets and the economy? Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, it's been been really interesting so far listening. Um, but I think in, in, in response to your question, in, we're seeing a, a really steady flow of, of requests from clients to, to add more data to our services. So first of all, you know, we, we started adding more coronavirus data. Um, so we took data from, from national governments, particularly in, in China, uh, and then we added the WHO, and then the more detailed co uh, content that the Reuters were providing as well. But we're getting more requests now for sort of higher frequency content. So people to try and track industries and, and how they might be recovering, you know, almost on a day-to-day -day basis. 
as you'd expect, you know, bond asset purchase um, statistics, really topical. Lots of people coming to us looking at that type of data. Again, people looking at, at long time series of data, looking at where some of these patterns may have happened before and what's worked and what hasn't worked in different types of um, scenarios. Unemployment data, um, particularly um, subnational unemployment and claimant data. And then, you know, we've, we've had a, a, a focus already, but, but lots of real estate and uh, construction information that people are, are interested in and looking to, to capture. So I think, you know, a couple of key areas really, one being uh, looking at the long histories, looking at what's happened in the past, trying to sort of gather information and, and learn from that, but also trying to look at where those sort of, you know, I don't want to say green shoots, but where those recoveries could, could happen and when they're going to happen for industries. And Eric, I mean, some of that data is the stuff that you, you, you say you've been looking at and trying to get a sense of when you need to start shifting your focus from a recession watch to a recovery watch. And I know yeah. you've been looking at some Google data and all sorts of very, not, not usually the type of macro data that an economist would be looking at. Maybe yeah. you can throw some insight. Yeah, and that. another another aspect of that is, is uh, uh, weirdly enough for economists, uh, a, a set of data that we don't normally look at um, in Fathom anyway, is the data on relating to monetary aggregates and um, things like broad mm -hmm. money, narrow money, all the rest of it, mm -hmm. which has been massively distorted. Shamit will probably disagree with me on this, but massively distorted <laughs> by um, QE and all the rest of it. But right now, mm -hmm. it's very useful, high frequency data that gives an indication of what's going on in lending, in deposits, and so on. And there are big changes over the last month in those data, which are very, very interesting in the UK and elsewhere. Mm. Uh, the shift from recession watch to recovery watch, I think uh, that Fathom's current view, with all the caveats which are appropriate here, but is that April um, was the trough in the level of global GDP. Uh, May is mm. going to be terrible, uh, but not as terrible in level terms as April. So we're past the bottom in level terms already, which means we should be thinking about the shape of the recovery, the structure of the recovery. So from next week on, we're not going to be recession watching, we're going to be recovery watching. And and I think as, I want to also just shift the mindset of ourselves to a more positive, uh, how, how quick is this going to be? That's, that's what I want to start thinking about. Mm. And I guess as ever, the difficulty is going to be lining up the forward thinking that you have to do in research and obviously servicing the financial markets, which are well ahead of all this at a time when people are losing their jobs now and worried yeah. about when they're going to get it back, right? Yeah. And yes, if they're absolutely. Going to get them back. Absolutely. And so, you're certainly not wanting to understate or underplay that, but it's just the, we're, we're, that period of rapid down uh, has, yeah. is over, uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully. And we're now in hopefully. a... Uh, hopefully in a question of how rapid is the upswing. And, and that's a, a, a different mindset that goes with that. And the data, the high frequency data, the stuff that Paul was talking about and that you were referring to, monetary aggregates, but other stuff too, that just gets us a picture of, all right, how rapid is this? Are we, are we above our expectations, below them? And that we're after mm -hmm. stuff at a weekly, even a daily um, basis to, to try and make those judgments, inform those judgments. It's super important now mm. to understand that for us and for everybody really who's planning uh, anything. Uh, yeah. From a data standpoint, I mean, just from my own, sorry, I'll let you go in a sec, Shamik. I mean, just from my own standpoint, you know, looking at these charts, and all sorts of outlets are providing them on um, infections and rate of um, uh, death increases and what have you. And it's all it all seems very, very detached from the, the human tragedy that we're dealing with. But at the same time, from a data point of view, um, for policymakers and people like yourselves trying to predict the response or give advice, surely we're going to be looking at COVID-19 death rates for a long time and infection numbers and this type of medical data that, that, that nobody would have dreamed of looking at um, advising people in financial markets just a few months ago. Um, maybe I'll just hand it over to Shamik on that one. 
Sorry, yeah, just very quickly, I was really struck by what Paul just said because, uh, you know, that's in my personal experience of, of what COVID-19 has done to the, the kinds of ways I am now analyzed it. So first of all, uh, you know, actually data providers like, like Refinitiv, data users like Fathom, I think really have stepped up to the plate here because there's been a lot more use, creative use of high frequency, you know, ultra high frequency data that we're getting from all sorts of sources that we never dreamt of using before. And I think, yes, it can seem a bit dispassionate at times, but that's kind of our job. And it's, and I do think yeah. the mm -hmm. institutions have stepped up to the plate there. But at the other extreme, what's really interesting is that there's been a huge, uh, you know, desire to examine history. And therefore, mm -hmm. you know, there's demand, I think, for looking at really, really long uh, data sets. There's a very useful one at the Bank of England that I use a lot, where yeah, we're data, taking data on a number of countries back to, to the 1300s. And, you know, sort of, it, it's, it's really, it, it's really, and, and you can use that to, to analyze the impact of big shots. So those two extremes, I think, have been, have been a big source of that. Mm. So, look, um, we wanted to take some uh, questions from uh, the phone audience on this. Um, I've got a few other questions to ask the panelists as well, but I'm just I'm just, um, seeing some of these come in. And actually, just as you were speaking, Shamik, a question came in just saying, which high frequency, either daily or weekly data sets, are you monitoring most closely? Now, they haven't asked that within the context of asset classes or economics, but it might be interesting to get, you know, maybe the top three from you, um, and Eric, in terms of what has come into the picture recently, like the monetary figures Eric was talking about that you weren't looking at previously, and maybe Paul, you can talk about mm -hmm. uh, demand on the on the product. Yeah. So the, the stuff I uh, we're following, I mentioned the monetary statistics. They tend to come out on a monthly uh, basis. They're super useful. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, the death. Uh, fatality rate statistics, obviously, we've talked about, and obviously everybody is, is monitoring those and trying to piece it together with infection rates, with uh, a proportion of the population. Uh, what's the right way to, to wrangle those data? Is it is it to express them as a share of the population or just in raw numbers or, or how? And, and the inferences you draw from them vary depending on exactly how you cut those data. <laughs> and that's that's been surprising to me that there's been so much potential for varying and for inferential differences, huh? depending on quite how you put those data together, the same underlying data. Other stuff that I'm that we're monitoring that I think is really interesting is stuff that has to do high frequency stuff that has to do with trade movements or movements of finance across borders. I'm interested in when the, those chains start to uh, reform. So stuff that has to do with freight uh, movements uh, uh, globally, um, shipping uh, uh, traffic, that, that kind of thing. Um, stuff that mm -hmm. has to do with uh, flows of oil uh, uh, around the world. Um, uh, the, the chaos in the oil markets has a lot to do with, um, with demand at the moment, but also to do with this game that's going on between Saudi and Russia, which complicates the process. But still monitoring how that's, mm. how that's doing, what the port capacity is in different countries and the utilization of that capacity, mm. uh, air travel, mm. those sorts of things, which uh, normally we wouldn't be concerned about because it's too high frequency. Why would anyone care what air travel is from one day to the next? Uh, but we do now because it tells us something maybe about what, whether we're in a V or a U or an L, and those judgments are critical uh, when it comes to making asset allocation choices, making government policy, and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the only thing as I'd add to that are, with looking at all of that, are essentially stuff that, that derives from mobile phone usage. So you, there's all sorts of things there, mobility indices, you know, rates of traffic, rates of communication. You can get that yeah. more or less instantaneously, and, that's, and Fathom have been very good at doing that. Thing. So that's, that's one thing. Um, and then uh, the other is, um, oh, I've just forgotten what it was, screw my head, oh, I may have to come back to it, sorry Ross. Another thing. It's all right, well, plenty of data in the process. <laughs> yeah. Mobility Part trackers are very, very, 
very interesting and as you say yeah. high, very high frequency that, that that stuff you can get at the city level and uh yeah. and really monitor follow how things are evolving mm. from moment yeah. to moment yeah. Yeah. and presumably the general public is going to start looking at some of these things too just to see whether yeah. people are moving around and whether they ought to be joining in right yeah. as the know, usual we, we caveat this, we, apply, so you shared yeah, with me on. ross some time ago a couple of, of snapshots of um uh air travel of the number of airplanes that are in the sky in different countries uh -huh. um, but you have to be careful about you have to be careful about all data but that one in particular i gather mm. um in the us you have to keep flying in order to retain your slots in the airport in the airports that, that yeah. are used yeah. otherwise you lose your slot yeah. so they're flying with nobody in them <laughs> uh, yeah. how, how stupid is, is that well, it's even more horrific than planes grounded, right? right? It's just, uh, right. yeah, it's, right. it's... The well, other one Paul, was... I mean, maybe, right. maybe we'll get you in. So, mm -hmm. Sorry to cut you guys off, um, but Paul, just uh, maybe give, give us an idea of some of the stuff that people have been looking at that maybe mm -hmm. you never would have expected since this all yeah. started. So, and like, so you know, the audience in particular is looking for these high frequency indicators, yeah? Yeah, so so I think there's a, probably a couple of things really. There's a, a new set of content we we brought on um, a, a few weeks ago, and I think it, it, I'm just going to hop back to when we were talking about the emerging markets and and some of the concerns mm -hmm. that, that the group had on that. Is we have a, a set of um, uh, indicators that will tell you how COVID could impact those those countries in different ways. So they look at mm -hmm. you know how much, it, and it's a rank or a score. Um, for every country in the world. So you can look at the healthcare expenditure, the number of nurses, hospital beds, uh, the population density. So all of those things that we know that um, causes, you know, this disease, a terrible disease to, to multiply and, and carry on and, and destroy uh, economies. Um, you can actually now look at, at you know, is our countries in Africa worse than going to be worse off than uh, countries in South America that maybe haven't been hit so much um, today. So there's some really interesting in factors, and we've got a, a lot of people who are looking at that uh, as well. Um, and then you know, look, I think Ross, you know, the the polls that, that the, the Reuters guys um, put together for us um, and put out in the product, I think they've been hugely valuable. Uh, you know, it's up to date. It's exactly what what people need to see that their latest opinion. So, I think probably uh, as a, as we can in short of time, those two are, are two I like to highlight. Well, we're always happy we've got demand for uh, for the polls. I, I, I find, well, I, I've done I've been doing this for a long time, and I find it um, interesting. You know, during times of no crisis, people usually snipe about. Um, surveys and predictions and how useless they are and nobody could ever predict the future and why would anybody care and then when when something like this happens all of a sudden everybody wants to know what the forecasts yeah. are yeah and yeah. um it just underscores the value right and you know i guess yeah. um we're forced to do point forecasts because you know we have a numerical number and a time series i know eric you in, at fathom are trying to steer people away from trying to tie down to a specific number and look at a range of outcomes. And obviously you would advise yeah. that to the Bank of England today. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it, it goes without saying, people just want to know what the range of opinion is out there. And yeah. it is very, very wide, it seems, at the moment. Um, Shamik, you, you were yeah. gonna say something there and I cut you off. You, you remembered yeah, one of those uh, data points, yeah? Yeah, don't worry, Russ. Just mentioning that we we're looking at credit card data as well, which seems very ah. Yeah, we've yes. moved on. <laughs> okay, so um, a couple more questions that have come in from um, the audience, um, more economic in nature. Um, uh, what do you think about the permanent? loss of output like how big will this permanent loss be say for the eurozone or globally they've asked i know eric you you know you, you mentioned earlier this takes us back to 2001 with the exception of 9 11 yeah. wasn't such a terrible year in terms of prosperity in the west um maybe not the same for argentina we say but uh Indeed. but <laughs> what about that permanent what about that Russia. permanent loss what, what, what how how big is this going to 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 be and will we ever recover it 
So the complacent sort of answer that most macro models would give you is there is no permanent loss. Uh, all we're talking about is a demand shock, a big one, right. that will come back and the supply side fundamentals are unchanged. So we'll be back to the same level that we would otherwise have enjoyed in mm. a couple of years or three or four years time. That's the normal mm. macro model as response. I don't agree with it. Um, I think there are, mm. there are good reasons to be concerned that the supply side will be damaged perhaps permanently yeah by this uh, shock. And, and one of the a way of putting that is, we're massively cranking up the involvement of the government in our mm. um, economy. Um, and the government has a massive role to play right now, but in steady mm. state, you don't want the government uh, uh, involved in your economy. It's easy to get in, it's less easy mm. to get the government out uh, after it's got in. And that tends to be the experience. Yeah. And the government doesn't make good choices about as, uh, about resource allocation across the economy, as Soviet Russia uh, illustrated and many other attempts to do that. Mm. Illustrated. I'm not saying we're going communist, but there's been a, mm. a, there's a big increase in the size of government that's going to come about as a result of this crisis. And the impact of that is probably negative for the long run steady state level of GDP that, that we're, we're likely to achieve. On top of that, we're socialising financial markets, particularly the losses that might be incurred yeah. by financial markets, whether they be banks or equity investors or anything else. There's the downsides are being picked up in large tranches by the government, and there's an implied promise mm -hmm. to pick up future downsides too which means the kind of risks that people will be taking those markets in steady state will be cranked up, and the allocation of resources across the economy that flows from that will change, and change probably for the worse, uh, undermining mm. again the growth rate that the economy, or the level of productive potential the economy can achieve in the long term. So for those sorts of reasons, I think this shock can drive us towards a lower average standard of living than we would otherwise have enjoyed permanently. Mm. How much lower? I don't know, four or five percent lower, numbers like that. Not right. 15, 20, 30 that we're talking about right now, but four or five percent lower in steady state. Different final point, different maybe <laughs> for Europe. Huh? So Europe mm. bifurcates. There's one world in which it just looks like the rest of us are four or five percent loss like everybody else. There's another world mm. where this is catastrophic for Europe. Uh, uh, you get another yeah. crisis, the whole euro implodes, financial crisis ensues. And then we're talking about a much bigger loss in the long term if that happens. Uh, but hopefully, and our, our view is it won't, that, that the way Europe, European policymakers behave is they do nothing at all until, I don't know if you can see this, the gun yes. is raised to their temple, the, the hammer is cocked yeah, and the power. trigger is squeezed, and then they act. Mm. Uh, and then the same process yeah. repeats itself again and again and again like that. But they act just before the trigger is pulled every time. Well, we're pretty close yeah. now to the trigger being pulled. And uh, if it's pulled, it's yeah. a disaster. But they probably will prevent it from being pulled as they have done in the past. And that's very simple. One, um, one other question, because we're, we're getting close to, um, to the hour here, but um, I wanted to, to throw it in there, maybe a good time to do it. Um, you're talking about you know size of the state, and obviously one of the potential outcomes of this is that in some places that underfunded their healthcare systems may end up funding them a lot better than they did, or even put put healthcare systems in place. Who knows, right? But that's a potential. Um, yeah. One question from from the audience was um, spe re referring specifically to Asian countries, and I think we know uh, which ones they're probably referring to, like South Korea in particular, as an example. They had an ideal response without country lockdowns in this first round. The question is, could that be used as a potential uh, template if there is another wave that hits um, the countries we've been discussing? And Absolutely. I guess what I would add on, on top of that is, is, is it possible, right? Have we got the, the ability to do that? Yeah. So is it possible is a tough question. If we don't have the physical capacity to do test and trace and all the rest of it like they did in South yeah. Korea, by the time the second wave hits, then we're idiots. We're absolute idiots because then we've got the example in front of us. Why not do yeah. that? Uh, whether yeah. people yeah. will comply with it in the same way that they did in South Korea here, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Shami, what do you think? 
Um, so, uh, first off, can I say I'm sorry we haven't got the time to reply to, to address the previous question. That's the one I fundamentally most disagree with Eric on. So that might be. <laughs> well, go for it. Oh, go well, for we it. Can we go can go back. Five minutes. <laughs> we can come. Yeah. Uh, just on the it's health care question, I think. Um, I think. Uh, yes. I mean, there are lots to learn from the experience of different countries, and Asia in particular has had a very different. Uh, different uh, route for all this. I would caution, though, that it's way, way too early to be drawing, you know, definitive conclusions from any of this. Um, really, this is going to take, uh, you know, until the disease becomes endemic and we've gone through the whole process to work out exactly what mm. the right policy response was. And, and I certainly wouldn't, um, at the moment, take, you know, anything for granted. For instance, you know, let's take something like temperature average temperature you know initially that was that was not regarded as as a, as a major factor here but it's striking mm -hmm. that these the asian countries which have higher sort of tropically high temperatures generally have had lower uh, infection and death rates let's see what happens mm -hmm. in the northern half of this summer so you know the, yeah. these kinds of yeah. we just don't know yet and we're going to have to find out but where eric is absolutely right is that we do need to be much more targeted, use trace and testing systems much more effectively than we've had uh, in the past, and that's, that's really important. Um, just very briefly on the previous question, I am a yeah. complacent math economist uh, by definition. Uh, I won't give you a full answer, but let me refer you to a great article that, that the greatest economist of them all, uh, Keynes, wrote in 1930, where he described essentially people as being no less productive, no less uh, able to come up with new ideas than they were before the crisis and after the crisis than they were before. What instead we have, he, de he described as what he described as like a car having magneto or alternator trouble. Now, this alternator is completely uh, a bit, but we, but we can replace it. And I actually am very much more uh, optimistic that the supply side of the economy will react very strongly to this and that demand will follow. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the time period, but it will. What we will see is a very different economy, but one that I think is operating at roughly the, the same levels of pre-crisis pre levels within a few years or so, simply because capitalist economies are very, very flexible. Mm. Um, so, look, um, we're, we're running... Uh, it's hard to, hard to follow with that one, uh, uh, Shamik. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we're running almost out of time here. Um, there's one other question that I wanted to put to Paul, um, so we might as well do that now. Um, I think it's, it's, it's on everybody's minds, too, in terms of data. I mean, this, this, this disease first originated in China. That's, that's, what, that's what we know from all of the, the reports and the facts now. It's now reopening its economy and mm -hmm. emerging from lockdown. Before yep. all of this happened, there's always been uh, difficulty in interpreting um, uh, economic data out of China and all sorts of data. Clearly, people are coming to you looking for this kind of stuff. What's your view on how we can best assess how that recovery is progressing through reliable data? Um, yeah. Is, 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 is there stuff in particular that you think is worth uh, looking at, given that that's, that's where we want to know if this, 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 this recovery really is going to take place globally? Yeah, and, and you know, China was a big focus for us, particularly last year, um, adding huge volumes of, of, of content for, for China that previously we hadn't been able to, to access. So we took a, a decision to get lots of national source content, as you'd expect from the, the central banks, um, from um, industrial authorities, um, stats offices uh, uh, across the board. But we also went out and, and got... Um, external views on, on China and brought that data in as well. You know, even some, some data that we, we, we got from, from our friends at Fathom as well that give you a very different view on China. Um, but I think looking at that, that recovery and, and how, because it's been such a vast country, we, we actually can dive down into that data. So we have the city level, we have the provincial level, and even uh, down to the, even the county level data. Now, some of that data isn't as up to date as, you, as you'd expect, or I'd hope it's not so frequent. 
but some of the city level data is and you know having access to that and seeing how parts of that country are are moving on since this um since this disease really gripped them uh it is quite fascinating so i think delving down into that but also you know just pointing out on the micro uh, macro vitals app there is a, a whole bunch of, of china recovery charts that have been produced so definitely worth having a look at those and you can already see some you know green i don't want to use that term green shoots again but you can already see some of the lines going northward let's put it like that mm. so definitely the place to start okay well um that's a good place to wrap up i think um we've got right to the hour here so just wanted to thank everybody on the panel eric britton from fathom Consum uh, consulting thank you shamik dar from uh BNY Mellon Investment Management, Paul Bacon from Refinitiv. I'm Ross Finley. Maybe we'll see you again when things are brighter than they are now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. Thanks.